Market research associations play an important role in the insights and research industry. They provide knowledge, resources, and guidance for research and insights professionals at any point in their career to help keep abreast of the newest trends and the most established practices in the industry. They support by setting guidelines and standards and working with governments and MR professionals to uphold and support both the market research practice and the industry itself in what's ultimately a self-regulated industry. And market research associations also help advance and promote market researchers themselves through conferences and networking opportunities to help advance their work, their businesses, and their careers. Market research associations aren't just important for insights professionals in the agencies and firms they work for, they also provide an important service for client-side corporate researchers and academic researchers as well. One such market research association is ESOMAR, the once European and now global market research association whose standards and codes are followed in more than 130 countries worldwide. Hello, I'm Duncan McGregor, Marketing and Communications Coordinator at Insitrix Research in Saskatoon, Canada, and your podcast host. In this, the 15th episode of Stories of Market Research, the Incentrix podcast, we got a chance to speak with the president of ESOMAR, Joaquin Brecha. He joined us all the way from Barcelona to talk about ESOMAR in particular and market research associations in general, what ESOMAR does and how it not only advocates, teaches and assists their members, but he also shares how he sees the association changing to meet technological realities that the insights and research industry is seeing as a whole, like passive data collection and AI. We also discuss a little ESOMAR history, how Joaquin became involved in it, and how he became the president of the association. Advocacy and networking, codes and guidelines, and doing your best to be like Madonna in an ever-changing world. All that and more in this episode of Stories of Market Research, the Insightrix Podcast. I'm here with Joaquin Brescia, President of ISOMAR and International Director at NetQuest. We've been chatting for a while now, and it's great to have you on the podcast. Thanks for coming on. Uh, thank you, Duncan. It's my pleasure. Well, it's great to have you here. We've been wanting to produce an episode about the role of market research associations like ISOMAR for a while now, so it's going to be great to talk to you about the subject. First, can I ask you about your role at ISOMAR? Yeah, I am the current president of ISOMAR. So this is an elected uh, post, and the presidency's term is for two years. So I was elected uh, as 2019-2020 uh, president, and, and then I will become former president, and then that's it. Excellent. How did you <laughs> How did you become involved with ESOMAR? That's very funny. Uh, so as you as you were mentioning, I I started the international activity of Nequest. Nequest is a is a digital collector company born in Barcelona. Uh, now we need to expand internationally, so I started to travel and and use different events as platforms to, to expand the network. So I, I got involved in at the SMR events because they were the best and, and the best platform for me to, to attend to because they, you have a very nice combination of people that you meet and the subjects and topics that are being uh, exposed. So I, I was getting involved, I'm more involved, and in 2014, uh, the then president Dan Foreman, uh, the English, uh, I think the last English president, so he just told me, why, why don't you run for council? There were elections, and I considered that. I ran for it. I was elected uh, as council member 2015-16, mm-hmm. and I really, I mean, it's, it's like always. When, when you get involved and you know things better and you are closer to the real thing, uh, you, you fall in love somehow. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I just was trapped in that, and, and then I got re-elected, and then I had the chance uh, in 2018 to run for president, and I did. Uh, so that's that's now my second year, my last year of presidency. That's awesome. Quick question. When did ESOMAR get started? I was looking on the website, and I couldn't quite see it. Okay, we're pretty old. Uh, it was, <laughs> yeah, it was founded in in 1947. Oh, cool. So we we celebrated the 70th anniversary in Amsterdam two years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, actually, almost three years ago, with September 17, and and the story is, is is quite nice. In that period, I mean, I am from Barcelona. I'm European, and I've been in different associations during my life, and and many of them were born just after the World War II. As, a, as an objective of getting people united, as an objective of, of really 
uh, transforming what had been a confrontation, a brutal confrontation, transforming it into okay, let's let's look for peace and let's look for cooperation and collaboration and let's let's extend ties uh, and, and, and bounds hmm. between countries. So SMR was born, um, founded by different market researchers. So we have to be proud to say that our profession is pretty old as well. I mean, we are a centenary profession, more than 100 years that people have been in a professional and methodic, methodological way asking other people what they think, what they do, what they prefer, whatever. Mm -hmm. So at that moment, uh, different professionals from different countries in Europe uh, gathered and founded SOMAR as a way of establishing common policies, common, common standards to, um, to really safeguard the profession. And where are you active? Uh, ESOMAR. Uh, ESOMAR. Uh, yeah. ESOMAR is, the, is the global community. So mm. ESOMAR, is the, uh, ESOMAR has presence in 103 countries around the globe, uh, more than 6,000 individual members, and almost 1,000 corporate members. So it's, it's worldwide. It's worldwide, and our footprint is worldwide. And we, I'm very proud of one thing is that we have one ESOMAR representative in almost every single country that I've mentioned, 103 countries. So we have more than 100 people involved locally in each country, uh, elevating the profession, establishing bridges with the local associations, and, and working to, to really uh, foster our profession and, and, and be the ESOMAR representative locally. So that's, that's a very, very nice way of having presence worldwide. Yeah, you've got a really big presence. That's really cool. Um, some of our listeners might not know exactly what the role of associations are. Could you mm -hmm. explain to our, our listeners exactly what ESOMAR is and how you help insight professionals and agencies? Yeah. Uh, before talking about ESOMAR, mm -hmm. um, people, people neglect on many occasions to think and that we have to, to be together for certain things. Uh, of course, there is competition. Of course, everybody needs to work on their interest. But there are some aspects that are beyond our scope, are beyond our own interest, and are on the interest of the whole community. Uh, we, market researchers, we have different challenges. And those challenges can be tackled if we are united, if we really add resources and efforts to work in, in that favor. Associations are key, are key on that, are key in the sense of building community, in establishing common policies on the benefit of everybody, mm -hmm. in defending, in defending our profession in front of the legislator. And when I say defending, I think that would be a nice subject to to, to talk about a bit later if you want. Sure, yeah, for uh, sure. Def de defending is that we have so many challenges in the digital era, and legislators know nothing about many of the things that we do. <laughs> that we have to educate them. It's we true. have to educate them because otherwise they are starting to to establish rules and legislate uh, blindly. And this is something that can have an extreme impact on our activity. Extreme, and in some occasions, it can indeed kill some of our practices. And our our role as associations is to defend our profession and put it in a better situation. So, having said this, so Esomar is this global association around the globe, uh, and, and I trust me, I, tr I, I really enjoy that position because uh, I'm talking to you now, you're based in Canada, but this morning I was, I was dealing with things from Germany and things from Peru and That's things cool. from Australia, and, and, and it's amazing, and, and then you can interact with people from everywhere in the world, and, and there is this international community, and I mean, it's, it's pretty, pretty interesting. So, uh, Esomar, I like always to say that we have like three main pillars. One pillar is is knowledge. No, one pillar is knowledge, and and we create knowledge and expand knowledge. And this is knowledge that we we create uh, via um, studies that we support or, or or we sponsor or by by all the events that we have that we attract the best of the best papers. In, in every country or regions or globally, and they are shared in our events or they are shared on on our podcasts or webinars or, or videos that we trans live transmissions that we do on, on video. And a second pillar is this uh, extreme activity that we have in terms of advocating for profession. Okay. And here we have had uh, very recent successes. Uh, particularly in Europe, 
because Europe is currently the region where most legislation activity is ha- happening. And it's the one that started with the GDPR. Yeah, I was about to mention that. So, <laughs> yeah. So, for instance, we we were we have been extremely active, um, defending and, and and teaching legislator on the GDPR, and because ESOMAR has been for these last 70 years extremely active in self-regulating, uh, we we created uh, together with the ICC the ICC ESOMAR code of conduct of of all researchers. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was renewed uh, three years ago, and today there are already 60 60 countries that. Uh, are working under this code and many of others that are recognize this code as the code of conduct for our profession. So so we could prove the legislator that we have been self-regulating uh, for all these years and they were so surprised that our interaction with them was was, was very positive and we could we could um, somehow somehow drive GDPR onto the favor of our profession. And, and with other directives from the European Union, such as the Copyright Directive or the E-Privacy Directive, we are being we are being very very uh, instrumental. For instance, in the Copyright Directive, it was a directive that legislator pretended that for every single post on social media that social media listeners wanted to uh, to analyze, mm-hmm. they would have to pay for each one of them because of the copyright yeah. and we could convince the legislator that this was not the case for for our profession that this would really kill the practice 100%. so uh we we really convinced them of the utility that this has and and now the researchers don't need to pay for every single post and on the on the e-privacy directive that is not also now being negotiated so we are also with some other institutions some other stakeholders we are leading um uh, a group of associations and, and institutions to also safeguard our practices in the digital uh, audience measurement. This, uh, some examples from Europe, but then uh, you know that what happens in Europe is replicated in different regions of the world. So you have, for instance, yeah. Brazil, or you have India, you have Japan, you have different countries that are also implementing or trying to implement the GDPR as it is or adapting a bit. Mm-hmm. So all our learnings in this negotiation with the legislator uh, are being implemented and can be used in these other countries. So we always keep this eye on helping our countries if the legislation is at a country level, on helping with our learnings uh, to, to, to safeguard our profession. And this has been, for instance, the case in different countries in LATAM regarding electoral uh, legislations. Uh, we have helped different countries in in convincing the parliaments parliaments in 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 saying telling them that the directive that they were uh, writing uh, was not the most suitable for the practice. So so these are a very very important very important uh, pillar of our business or the solid business activity. Yeah. So as I said, uh, three pillars. One is knowledge. The other one is this legislation and the standard production. And the third one is uh, the business platform. Uh, as I told you, I started to use this in, in, in my second stage as researcher. So my first stage as researcher for me SMR was mainly knowledge. That was some years ago. But then when I got back into the profession, and I used more initially SMR as this business platform for networking and connecting with companies mm-hmm. and, and, and present my company uh, to other companies and, and make business. And this is essential, as I was telling you. I mean, you build a network, a multinational network, international network that is extremely useful for business and also uh, as friends. I mean, I have now many friends around the globe. And this, just following them on Twitter or on social media, I can tell you that I am so much updated about what's happening in every in every country in the world that this is quite amazing. That's awesome. Now, you were speaking about how you have different members in different industries, correct? How do you give value to folks that maybe not be in market research themselves? How does ESOMAR provide uh, guidance and uh, leadership to those folks? So, as I, as I was mentioning, there is a part which is knowledge. Yeah. Uh, if you come to our events, uh, you will always get back home with some ideas that you can implement just when you're back. Uh, you will also get the ideas of what's 
the new trend or what's what is the next step of our profession because there, there are the presentations and discussions that you find there are pretty unique mm -hmm. i can tell you last year our congress was in edinburgh in scotland and the level and the quality of the content was astonishing and it's something that I've been fortunate enough to be traveling since then around different countries, and many people have told me it's been maybe maybe the best or one of the best congresses I've ever attended. So it's, it's knowledge. And then a, a very important thing, all presentations in our events, uh, speakers must write a paper, okay. and we record them on video. So we have the largest worldwide uh, repository of knowledge in market research. So we have all papers, all videos, all webinars uh, that ha we have had in in our events for the last 70 years. Wow. So if if you need to, if for training for training your teams, mm -hmm. or for you to being updated on the latest trends, or if you need to write an article, write a post, or even to write a proposal uh, with with uh, let's say a more creative, a more open and innovative proposal to your client you can consult uh, this repository of information, which is amazing. I can tell you I've, I've, I've done it on many occasions to write articles or even to get inspired for speeches mm -hmm. or for proposals. And you just want to, I mean, it's like on YouTube. I mean, you just start with one, say, wow, this is good. And then you just follow with another one and you can spend some, some time just uh, reading or watching the recorded videos. This is, for instance, a member, exclusive members, uh, let's say, oh, okay. service. So you, you must be a member to, to access to that one. Well, if uh, there's ever a reason to become a member, there you go, right? That's it. That's, <laughs> a, that's, a, that's an extremely good reason. Uh, other reasons, all the guidelines, all the standards. That was something are, I wanted to get into with you, actually, those ESOMAR yeah. standards. Those are huge. Yeah, this is huge. And it's also a kind of safeguard for you. Mm -hmm. uh, you say if you follow these guidelines, you follow these standards, you know that you are on the safe side, um, particularly today, which we are getting into many blurry areas in the digital world and and this is important to 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 have some guidelines that that guide you through this mess and oh, for instance in all this legislative thing uh, we have this service of consultancy on on assessing you whether you are uh, adapted to the gdpr uh, rule or you are not and we also help you this is one thing or for instance, some other things that we are doing as well in cooperation with our associations is uh, whenever there is a disciplinary um, breach, so one, one member, a member of SOMR is not behaving according to the code. Mm -hmm. So we have um, a platform in which, okay, you can, you can upload this doubt or this problem and, and we will find a solution and this solution is shared for the rest of members. So, so everybody is always updated on what's wow. good or right practice in, in the industry. I can see that be very, very, very handy. Not only for researchers and agencies, but like you were saying, uh, client side researchers as well, so they can keep yeah. up to date, correct? Yeah. yeah. For instance, on the client side, we, we are working on a saga of reports. We started a report, um, if I'm not wrong, the title was how to demonstrate the value of insights in your organization. So uh, what we want, because because uh, the whole industry is living many challenges, and insights managers in and clients, in brands, they also have their own challenges. And today is key to be relevant. Today is key to be relevant in their organizations. And today we are in a moment in which many people are managing data, many people are dealing with data, and many people feel with the authority of getting into conclusions and share these conclusions uh, through data uh, to, to stakeholders or to the CEO or to the senior levels of the company. And this sometimes creates some problems and this sometimes creates some disruptions internally. So we want to help all those people that manage data to, to get to conclusions on how to be relevant within their companies mm. and, and, and take the lead. Uh, to, to take the lead uh, as leaders within the company. So uh, we are investing quite a lot of energy and resources to, to, to bring ideas and to bring knowledge to practitioners on the brand side, on the end user side. Can I talk to you for a minute about the Young Isomar Society? I was looking on yep. your webpage there, um, and if, if I were a young market research professional, I, I would see probably a little bit of value in that. Could you explain it a little? Yeah, uh, for us, it's, it's key to attract new talents. Mm -hmm. 
is is key, and and particularly today, where uh, I mean, we 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 are a very sexy profession, yeah. but on many occasions we do not succeed in transmitting that, mm. and and it's happened on many occasions that people might have sometimes an idea of market research, and then when you explain what you do and and, and the utility of the things that we do and how we manage data and the conclusions we get to and how instrumental these conclusions are for businesses or for associations or organizations, and then they realize how sexy it is. Yeah. So uh, the Young Omar is a way of promoting activity and promoting a sense of community among the youngsters. And, and for instance, there are very interesting initiatives. We have, for instance, the Young uh, Research Talent, and it is a, a, an initiative that was born in Hong Kong. Our members in Hong Kong Established this uh, research called Talent, so it's a it, it's a program in which young researchers we work with more senior researchers on social activities. So they use research to boost and help uh, NGOs, and so it's the social side of research. And then there is a contest, and, and the best wins and who wins have different prizes. So this was an idea originated in Hong Kong, I think, three years ago. And now it's being it's being exported to many other countries, many other countries. I just saw the two days ago. I saw it announced on LinkedIn from my colleague in Peru, and they are going to have it, and in the other countries as well. So this is an activity to to boost the young talent. Another one in our events, regional and global congress, mm -hmm. we have also the Young Researcher Award, and there is an annual one, which is uh, the prize. If I'm not wrong, is uh, well, maybe maybe I'm wrong about the the money, but I think it's no less than four thousand euros. Oh. Uh, now now I don't remember exactly the the, the figure. Maybe it could be ten thousand, but oh. I should check. It's real Sorry money, though. That. That's for sure. It's money. Yeah, yeah, it's money. But it's not also money. So it's a contest, and and it's uh, for from one for answer, one hand is an extremely beautiful and exciting con contest, and on the other is is uh, for young people is is amazing because. Uh, for instance, in, at Congress, you young people can submit a video with the, their idea. If it is chosen, they have the opportunity to go to Congress, and they have 60 seconds to to give a snapshot of of their idea. So, uh, and uh, 60 seconds to develop the idea. And if people vote, and if that paper is voted, then they have 20 minutes to present uh, their paper. And for a young talent under 30. To be able to present a paper in front of an audience of more than 1,000 uh, senior people uh, is immense. This is immense. Yeah. So we, we do different things to encourage uh, young talent. It's important too, too, because you're right about people not in the business, not really understanding what the business is about. Before I got into it, I started in uh, in journalism and ended up over here in marketing, and I've came into an understanding of market research as focus groups and maybe the occasional survey. And when I got into it, boy, it's changed a lot since the 80s, hey? There's a lot of new technology impacting the business quite a lot. It's, do you see technologies like, uh, say, passive data or uh, web scraping, that kind of thing, AIs, changing the role of ESOMAR or its guidelines? Yeah. Uh, we are. We are. Okay. Uh, and the, the other day, um, my, speech, my speech at the opening... Uh, my opening speech in Edinburgh last year, one of the subjects I treated was identity. Identity, because, I mean, changes are accelerated. And the digital era it has accelerated everything. So, of course, it has, it has completely changed our activity in many, in many ways. So I had this, this reflection on identity. And, and identity, in the end, is you have to identify what, what is the core the core values and principles that make you who you are. You have to identify that and get rid of what is not core and adapt to change and adapt to the new things. And for instance, think of Madonna. Uh, if, if you think of her, you, 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 you will always recognize her. But if you take the different moments in her life, she, she has been she has been like maybe maybe forty Madonnas. She's one Madonna, but you could think that there's it's forty. No, it's one single Madonna, but she has always been adapted to to her time. Uh, we have to do the same, and we're doing the same. By the way, we're doing the same. And my reflection in, in Edinburgh was: we are under this change. We have to identify our, our identify our core principles. I understand that we have two main core principles. 
one is uh, honest and permanent interest and willingness to in understand people, an honest willingness to understand people, and the second one is ethics. Second one is we treat people ethically, we treat people right, and we treat the data and the information of people in an ethical way. So I think these two main principles are what define us. So the technology we use to understand what people do, prefer, like, share, or view, we have to do them in those, following those two principles, and then the technology we use, the methodologies we use, is going to be adapted with, with uh, the context that we have. So if you think, for instance, the ladies that 80 years ago had to understand how people were using the Procter & Gamble products, and they were getting into the houses and talk with housewives in their kitchens, uh, okay, we, we still can do that. But today, uh, we might be doing many other different, uh, using many other different methodologies to understand what those housewives or those uh, shoppers of, of soap uh, <laughs> are purchasing and using the soap. So, so we have to adapt to, to the time. Okay. And how do you see that happening, though? Yes. Yes. And in a, in a, we said in a very nice way in the last years. Uh, I mean, if you, if you think of 10 years ago mm -hmm. and today, uh, the, I mean, we have had a deluge, I think. We have had an invasion of technology, and we have also been hungry for technology, which on some occasions has blinded us as well, mm -hmm. because technology seems to be like uh, everything, and it's not technology. I like to say two things. Technology is a mean, and second, technology is not neutral. Technology is not neutral. Technology is a reflection of the principles and the values wow, and okay. interests and yep. objectives of the, the, the technology maker. So th this is when ethics come. And, and you have to be, you have to, to, to behave in an ethical way because you, it's not neutral. And you can really create big damage yes, on depending on how you use technology. So, yeah, technology has come to our industry. We have adapted to it. And today uh, we, have, we have data of many different kinds, many different kinds. And the problem is that people tend to think that it's easy to collect data huh. and, and then to merge and match data to, to achieve this understanding. And it's not. It's mm -hmm. not. It seems easy, but it's not, it's not so easy. But it's true that technologi technologically today, we can have extreme, uh, an extreme wealth of data. And it's all about how to, uh, learning how to interpret that data, right? And like you were saying, yeah. the ethics of it is a very big thing. It's a very big thing. It's, it's ethics, and it's also understanding the context. Uh, I am very interested. My, my motto as president has been building bridges between, between people, mm -hmm. practices, and regions. Uh, building bridges. Why? Because I, I see that there is, there is a, a kind of decoupling, a potential decoupling, which is uh, the mark, more traditional market research. So this market research that comes from, from asking, from surveys, from focus groups, so this more traditional approach, and then the pure digital market research. So these people that get data from these different data lakes, and they get into conclusions. And, and, and certainly, people come from different backgrounds and different interests. So there can be a, a, a kind of challenge that these two worlds don't get united. And my role is to build those bridges because I understand that to, to understand people, to understand consumers, to understand shoppers, we must have this holistic view and have the two, the best of the two worlds. And in that sense, I like to talk about, uh, well, two things. I, I use okay. here an example that, that a colleague in UK told me, and I really love that one. So he has this team of data scientists and like 10 people, and he asked them, I want to understand how people consume low cost, how people consume low cost. Mm -hmm. So after 10 days of analysis, they just come back, they present their conclusions, and he asks, uh, what did you do? What did you do? Because it makes no sense. And the, the answer was, well, everything hashtag low cost in all social media for the last six months is here. So mm -hmm. the question is, do you really think that people consume low cost and then they hashtag it on social media? Do you think this is how people do? So. We need what I call translators. We need translators. We need people that understand, uh, have this big picture on, on what, what, is, what is the correct questions? What is, what is the correct question to pose for that business? And what should be the answer? How can we approach the answer? 
and then the people that really can can work the data in a, in a massive way uh, because we have all these big data sets. So we need the best of the two worlds, but you need the context. You need to have the context and know that eight is not the same as 80. Uh, yeah. there, is a, there is a say in Spanish, no, ocho no es lo mismo que ochenta, as <laughs> eight is not the same as 80. So you have to differentiate what is 80 and what is eight uh, to, to really have a good picture of everything really articulates the role of insights professionals actually um, being able to tie data together and translate that data because um, with technology nowadays it's becoming like you're saying there's all these different sources of data but you still have to be able to tie them together and have the insight to be able to figure out what it all means correct and yeah and we have this challenge today of automation yeah, right. imagine that you just press a button and you get a super nice PowerPoint or dashboard okay you have data you have things but are there first, how, how, how can you make sure that you can interpret it by data? Uh, have you do a driving license to drive a car? Because you need a driving license to drive a car, you need some experience. So in this automation world, we need criteria. We need criteria, we need people that have the context uh, to understand and interpret the data and tell the story around the data. We need this knowledge. So that's why I call we need. I always say we need this bridge between all these practices, and we need those translators, those people that can really give this higher um, point of view. I wanted to talk about ESOMAR conferences again, really quickly, because it, I think there there's a lot of value there for folks. And I know you guys have got one coming up in Toronto in September. Can you tell me a little bit about it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's our it's our main conference. We we run different events um, mm -hmm. around the globe. For instance, next one is in Delhi, and is the the conference for APAC. And then in Lima will be the conference for LATAM. Then we have uh, for end clients, for end user, for brands. We have one in June, uh, Twitter headquarters. This will be very interesting, this one. Uh, we will replicate that then in, in Europe with, well, not replicate, I mean, also with another different program, mm -hmm. but also for end users, only end users to discuss their topics. We'll have Summary Academy. So for people that want to upgrade uh, their learnings, uh, we have Summary Academy in Amsterdam in June, also super interesting. And then uh, Congress. Congress is the the big big thing, the big mm -hmm. event. So imagine 1,200 uh, people, uh, exhibitors, uh, attendees, delegates, keynote speakers, yeah. and all these best papers that have been curated. So, for instance, today, this week, uh, I think it's next week. Sorry, next week, the program committee is meeting in Amsterdam to uh, go through the more than I think it's 200 something papers that or submissions that they have received and they have to select the best of the best for, for the program. And so they just have different, uh, let's say, lines of program, and they want they need to fill the program with the best of the best, and then with keynote speakers. And it's the big feast. And so it's, it's networking, it's community, it's business, it's know-how, it's everything. Yeah. And also the good thing about that is for some years already, we are broadcasting uh, events. You're saying so, that? Yeah, so events like uh, Fusion, for instance, an event which we fuse qualitative and big data, qualitative and big data, we broadcast the whole event, the whole, all the conferences for Congress. In Congress, it's so huge, and we have different tracks. So there is a proper program where there is a program with a preselection of papers, and this is being broadcasted, and then also we have interviews. Also, it's a way for sponsors to promote and advertise. So... Uh, we try to always with this, with this in mindset, with this set of mind of uh, creating community, spreading knowledge and, and best practices. Um, this SMR TV is extremely successful. So you next event will be SMR APAC in Delhi. You can connect and, and watch and follow the program that is happening in Delhi. Then in Lima, uh, then this other one. Uh, Fusion for sure, and some others. I mean, not not all of them are broadcasted, but many of them are broadcasted, and it's for free. For now, it's for free. Yeah. Do I have to and be? Then, a and then, uh, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to uh, interrupt you. I just wanted to ask: Do you have to be a member to attend and to watch? To to watch on TV? No, it's, no? it's open. Excellent. It's open, but of course, it's not the same to watch it on TV than being there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Being there, then you interact with the speaker. You have this. Uh, discussions, or you, I mean, you, you meet people, you do network. It's not the same, okay? But if you cannot attend a conference, 
you have at least the option of watching it online. Mm -hmm. And then if you are a member, but you have to be a member, then you have access to the paper. And you know, a, a 20 minutes presentation is not the same that uh, some pages of paper in which you can really dig down the, the methodology and the example and everything. Excellent. And now if I wanted to attend live, uh, just to go to one of the conferences, I could go to one of those if I weren't a member, correct? If you're a member, you have a prize. You have, if you're not a member, you have another prize. Gotcha. So, oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that makes it more available to everybody, right? Yes, yes. And, and for instance, for Canada and in the events, we try. We also try to we also try to push for membership because the more we are, the more things we can do. So we also try to give a nice benefit for non-members to become a members to become a member to benefit from congresses or events. Awesome. People can find more information about this on the ESOMAR website, correct? Yes, yes. Excellent. The ESOMAR website is very rich. And ESOMAR is headquartered in Amsterdam and is managed by a team of 35 people. So and it's a very competent, enthusiastic team um, that com very nicely combines experience with youth. And it's a superb team. And they will be more than happy to inform you about anything you might need. Yeah, I'd tell any of our listeners to definitely go and check it out because it's, at the very least, what you offer for learning opportunities is pretty amazing. Well, I want to thank you a lot, Joaquim, for uh, coming on our podcast. Uh, really got a lot out of it and learned a lot from you. Uh, so thanks for coming on. Uh, thank you, Duncan. And I am just, uh, will be happy if you want another day to talk about other things, such as, you know, behavioral data or things like that. I will be more than happy to do that. Oh, gosh, that's a whole new can of worms that I'd love to talk to you about. Maybe for another yeah. episode. Of course, of course. And, um, well, it's been my pleasure, Duncan. And I would love, I would love to see a big, big um, group of professionals from Canada and the U.S. Uh, in our Congress in Toronto. That would be amazing. Excellent, excellent. Well, we'll have lots of information on our website. They'll be able to find, our, find it, and uh, we'll make sure to link it for them. So okay. thanks very much for, uh, thanks for coming on. Thank you so much. And there you have it. We'd like to thank ESOMAR President Joaquin Brecha for joining us in Barcelona. Having wanted to talk about the role of market research associations like ESOMAR and his role there was really informative and enlightening. If you'd like to know more about ESOMAR and the value of membership to the association, please go check out their website. They're an amazing resource for anyone who's interested in research at all. Whether you're a corporate or academic researcher or a market research professional, you'll definitely find a lot of value there. Go check it out. You'll also find information on their website about upcoming ESOMAR events and conferences like the ones we spoke about on the podcast. And speaking of events, if you can get to Toronto this fall, ESOMAR will be holding their 73rd annual congress there from the 13th to the 16th of September. If you've never been to an ESOMAR event before, be sure to try and make it out to network, share your ideas, and learn from other members of the research community. There'll be links that will help you find the ESOMAR website and to get more information about their upcoming events, like their congress in Toronto this fall, on the Incitrix website www.insightrix.com. Head over to the podcast episode page and check them out. I'd also like to thank you folks, our amazing fans who make it all possible. And before we go, we've got a very special announcement. The Insightrix podcast has been nominated for what's a pretty prestigious award. We've been nominated for the very first ever annual market research podcast award from Little Bird Marketing in partnership with Green Book. Stories of Market Research is up for consideration against some stiff competition from companies like Ipsos UU, Fuel Cycle, Happy Market Research, and our friends at the Insights Association, and we could really use your help to secure the win. If you're listening to this episode before March 31st, 2020, please head over to info.littlebirdmarketing.com backslash mr hyphen podcast hyphen award to vote for Stories of Market Research, the Insightrix podcast, to win. And if you didn't get that URL, that's okay. You can find a link on the Insightrix website, www.insightrix.com backslash podcast. We'd sure appreciate it, and it will help get stories of market research out there in front of more people like yourself, awesome folks with an interest in market research. And last but not least, please be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the Incitrix podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Stitcher, or anywhere else you access your podcasts. Thanks again for listening. We'll be back again in another couple of weeks with another episode of Stories of Market Research, the Incitrix podcast. Music